I think that this coming election is going to be very, very entertaining. American politics is starting to get interesting again. It's been pretty boring since Trump left, I'll be honest. But things have really been building uh, because things have gotten consistently worse since Biden took office. Some of which is directly his fault, some of which is not his fault, and others, other things are indirectly his fault. It's a mixed bag. You can't blame Biden for every little thing that has gone wrong. But the fact of the matter is, is that since he has taken office, things have gotten a lot worse. And rather than trying to do what needs to be done to make these things better, like, say, the cost of living, uh, Biden is going out of his way to antagonize and alienate uh, certain parts of the country. Now, granted, it's people who didn't really vote for him to begin with, at least in the case of gun control. But uh, with the rest of this stuff, <laughs> with the uh, what is euphemistically known as a cost of living crisis unfolding, uh, he's affecting people who voted for him and those who didn't vote for him equally. And this isn't something that we're really used to seeing in American politics in the last few years. Uh, we have had tribal uh, punitive politics in which, uh, in the words of Barack Obama, whatever leader is in office, you know, they reward, they punish their enemies and they reward their friends. That is what Obama called it. And pe when people voted for Trump, they wanted him to do the same thing. He wasn't super effective at it, but at least he tried. And it, certainly the perception when Trump was in office was that he was rewarding his supporters, doing things for them that made them happy, and he was absolutely driving his enemies up a wall. Since Biden came into office, however, uh, he has, you know, annoyed, certainly, his enemies, meaning the people who didn't vote for him. But I don't think necessarily that sending billions and billions of dollars uh, in both just cash and arms to Ukraine, and let's be honest, the cash is going to make its way back here to the United States into the pockets of uh, the military industrial complex. That's the way that these uh, military aid packages always work. The only people who really get anything out of this are the most partisan of Democrats, the kinds of people who uh, vaguely uh, associate spending money on this war in Europe uh, to Russiagate, which they're still very upset about. But uh, to the average American who is not obsessed with Russiagate, whether they be a Biden voter, a Trump voter, or somebody who didn't vote at all, which let's remember the U.S. is not exactly a high voter turnout country. We have high voter turnout states, uh, places like uh, Florida. I think we had like a 75 percent turnout in uh, 2020. That's because we're more of a competitive state and we have more of a culture of voting. We have an identity here that our votes matter, Florida in particular. And there are certain states like that. I think New Hampshire is probably another one. Uh, Iowa and Ohio, although Iowa and Ohio are um, not as competitive as they used to be. Now there is Florida for that matter. But the country overall, the whole of the population, uh, you know, you we're lucky to get half of the country to vote in an election. So the vast majority of people in this country uh, supported neither Trump nor Biden, yet they are still feeling the same sting and, uh, from Biden's policies. And to be fair, does Biden's war in Ukraine, is it really directly harming uh, these unaffiliated voters and these voters of his and the Trump voters? Does it really harm anybody? To see all these all these dollars and all these military resources go over to Ukraine, after all, I mean the the U.S. budget doesn't really mean much of anything. It's just numbers, uh, you know, on paper in digital accounts. Uh, the, you know, the U.S. spends as much as it wants every year. Uh, it doesn't really mean anything. We've been racking up trillions and trillions of debt, uh, going back to, uh, I guess, the 80s at this point. And so, I would say that. It's not directly harming people, but when people are experiencing so much hardship in their own life, when they increasingly cannot pay for their own rent, when they cannot afford the same quality of food 
that they're used to buying, when they can't uh, go out to eat uh, as, as frequently or perhaps at all uh, these days, when they see the federal government and, and Biden, when they see that their priorities are on helping Ukraine, when there's clearly a lot of economic pain and turmoil here at home, after all, uh, the f people forget that the first quarter GDP print was negative. It was like negative 1.2 percent or something like that. So we're half. We've got a half. We've got one foot uh, through the door uh, of the next recession. If this quarter prints negative as well, which it likely will, we will officially, according to the Federal Reserve, be in a recession. And what Americans see when they turn on the TV is they see that our president and our government is concerned about some other damn country's war in Europe. And if there's one thing that Americans throughout history have shown uh, little to no interest in, it's fighting European wars. Uh, American politicians have always had to trick and false flag the American people into supporting European, uh, American involvement in European wars. And so at this stage, it's pretty darn clear Americans are not that concerned about what's going on in Ukraine. They might be, you know, worry about it in a vacuum. If you ask them, oh my gosh, look at this war in Europe. You want to help these people. They might say, oh, well, of course, I'd like to help those people, you know, in a perfect world. But when they themselves can't pay their rent, when they can't afford a carton of eggs, uh, when they're having to go from uh, making a three-egg omelet for breakfast to a two-egg omelet to a one-egg omelet to just eating, I guess, bits of diced onion fried in a pan uh, and eating onion skin sandwiches for lunch. At that stage, people in America don't give a damn about what's going on in Ukraine. And so tonight, President Biden is going to be addressing the nation at 7.30 p.m. On what topic? Uh, we're told gun violence, uh, which is code for gun control which they've had to do away with the term gun control because that itself used to be a euphemism. Oh, gun, we have to control these guns. They're out of control. We have to get, you know, we need gun control. And then that became a bad thing because people know what gun control is and they don't like it. It's not popular. So they had to change it to, well, we need to take steps to address gun violence. You see, look at all this gun violence around us. Uh, you d didn't you hear a doctor and his receptionist and a, a nurse and a patient uh, were just shot? Uh, uh, by a gun in Tulsa, Oklahoma yesterday. And you might say, oh my gosh, they were shot by who? Don't worry about it. They were shot by a gun. <laughs> Don't worry about who the shooter was. Some of you might be wondering, oh, is this another incident of white supremacy? Don't worry about that. Don't look into it any further, really. So while all this is going on, while housing is more unaffordable in this country than it has ever been, depending on where you live, it's certainly more unaffordable where I am than it's ever been. It's worse than 06. And that's true for much of the country. In fact, a lot of cities that didn't even that weren't even affected by the housing bubble way back in uh, the early 2000s are affected by this one. So this is their first housing bubble. These people, you know, never experienced anything like it. You have lifelong member, uh, lifelong residents, of people who were born and raised in these cities like Boise, Idaho, and Austin, Texas, out on the streets panhandling because their neighborhoods uh, were rapidly gentrified by the coastal elites. I see it in in my own town certainly. Um, you go in the, uh, the, the closer you get to the coast, the more houses you see that are just being demolished and rebuilt bigger. Why? Because all these houses, uh, you know, they're million dollar houses now and they're a thousand square feet. So they got to tear them down and build mansions. And if you go east, further away from the water, you see nothing but houses being built, mansions. These small houses that were once upon a time affordable, you know, back in the 20s, 30s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, 2010s, they're all being knocked down, replaced with mansions. And nobody's going to build, uh, you know, a small affordable house in this kind of environment. They're all building, you know, these 3,000 square foot plus palaces. But don't worry, they're also building uh, these apartment buildings. Uh, they're, five st they're, they're building them all over the country, these five-story stick frame buildings, uh, which were just legalized uh, by a small um, uh, 
building code change a couple of years ago. It's interesting if you look into it. Um, in which, you know, they'll rent you for anywhere from 1200 to 1500 a month, maybe possibly more, depending on the city, uh, a, a little pod that you can live in. Now I'm indulging a bit. I'm embellishing this. It's not quite like the pods that you see in the in San Francisco and, uh, you know, uh, L.A., this pod share company. It's not quite that bad. These aren't bunk beds. They are real apartments. But my point is you're paying twelve to $1,500 a month for a studio. You know, it's it's nowhere that you're going to raise a family. There are, in fact, nobody's raising families. I just saw a story. Uh, gosh, I should have. I, 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 I've read too much today. I can't quite remember where this was. It might have been Zero Hedge. Most of what I read is... Or, well, I try to read a lot of things on Zero Hedge, but the site, as you all know, is, is terrible with its ads. It's, it's almost unreadable. I get too frustrated. I have to click off of Zero Hedge after a while, and I try to find the same story on other websites. But the stat in the headline was something like one-third of Americans uh, who are making... $250,000 a year, which, remember back when we were talking uh, the Obama administration, he wanted to set that, um, that was where you started with the higher tax bracket, was uh, $250,000. And I think his, his pledge was, well, I'm, not, I'm only going to raise taxes for Americans making more than $250,000 a year. And this was this incredibly huge number of income. Like, I didn't know anybody, I, I, I probably still don't know anybody who makes $250,000 a year. Well, the, the story was, and I'll try and find this and link to it, one-third of people making $250,000 a year are living paycheck to paycheck. Because in most metro areas in America these days, that's just not very much money. You know, we used to we used to hear stories like that about people who, you know, who would move to New York City and try and get a big job. And they'd tell you back, tell, tell the people back home how much money they're making. They'd go, wow, well, you're making so much money. You must have a you know, real nice place and a fancy car and, and, and go out to fancy restaurants. And, you know, the answer was always, well, no, I live in a crappy apartment uh, in, in, a, in a rough neighborhood. And I take the subway to work and I can't, you know, I couldn't afford a car even if I had a parking space. And that's because the cost of living in New York City, in, you know, Manhattan, was uh, you know always astronomical compared to middle America. But now we have that same phenomenon all over the country. And Biden's response is to cancel some student debts, which I don't think is necessarily the, a terrible political strategy, uh, although it is a pretty small number of people who actually have student debts. So there's a lot more other things that you could do that would help everybody. You know, like I didn't take out any student loans when I went to college. That's silly me. I guess I couldn't read a room. I, I thought about it at the time because even back then there were talks about, oh, they should cancel student debt. And I thought, you know, should I rack up a huge student loan and just take out a bunch of money and just buy crap with it? You know, that's probably fraud. But that's what everybody else probably did. They probably took out these student loans and spent it on alcohol and drugs. But I thought, you know what? I, won't, I can't do that because what if it doesn't get canceled and I actually have to pay that debt back? So I said, you know what? I'm not going to take out any student loans. I think I'm just going to try and pay my way the, <laughs> the normal way. And so you've got people like me, plus everybody who didn't go to college at all, who gain nothing from Biden uh, knocking off uh, $10,000 in, in student loans. And now tonight, we've got gun control, which helps approximately nobody. It is a good wedge issue to energize some of the base, although most data that I've seen, and just anecdotally I can tell you, people on the right, gun, uh, you know, gun enthusiasts, are much more passionate uh, and, and in greater numbers about guns than the anti-gun crowd. Because typically, the people who are anti-gun are people who just are very unfamiliar with guns. Those are the people who are the most uh, you know, openly anti-gun and say, oh my gosh, yeah, I think guns should be illegal. Get rid of them. That class of people do not encounter guns on a regular basis. And so naturally, it's, not, it's, not, it's never going to be their top issue. There's very few people on the left who have... Uh, gun control as their number one issue. It's something that largely they're all going to support, 
unless they're one of the few people on the left who own guns, which they do exist. You know, you've got uh, your good hardcore commies uh, that own guns. But for the most part, people on the left and Democrat voters are ignorant of guns, and so they're just happy to get rid of them. They have the attitude that they're happy to outlaw anything that really that they don't personally have an interest in. I'm sure that you could talk the vast majority of these people, typically suburban white women, into uh, outlawing motorcycles. And you ask them, uh, well, why should we outlaw motorcycles? Well, because I don't ride a motorcycle. I don't like them. And you could tell them that about anything. You know, outlaw painting your house purple. Uh, and you ask them, well, why, why should we do that? Why shouldn't people be allowed to paint their house purple? Well, I don't like the color purple. That was a terrible movie. And so this is not going to do anything to save the Democrats for the midterms. In fact, I think it'll have a net negative effect if Biden now tries to come out and, you know, go hardline against guns or something, because he needs something. He needs something to latch on to, to distract from the economy, because he's not doing anything to make things better. You know, I talked about yesterday, because remember, when I do these videos, I don't plan anything out. This is just me venting with everything that is bothering me for the day. Yesterday, I was kind of talking out of my ass a bit when I was, you know, speaking about running engines on crude oil. And it's saying, you know, hey, there's this huge refiner's premium. Why don't we try and just run vehicles on crude oil? And I talked about, you know, part of the problem is that the industry has been promoting all this electronification and things. And, you know, the fuel systems are so precise that wouldn't work now. But on older stuff, it could. And you could promote people, you know, trying to manufacture things and make them simpler and blah, 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 run on crude oil. <laughs> but I really was kind of talking out my ass about that part. So, like, it does that. It, you know, I've thought about it, but I have, I've never done that much research into running an engine on crude oil. And I looked it up, uh, Project Farm, great channel. Every video he does is fantastic. He has tried running both uh, gasoline and diesel engines, a car, you know, a carbureted gasoline engine and a mechanically uh, fuel-injected diesel engine. Wait, did I say carbureted gasoline engine? That's what I meant to say. So both, you know, standard types of engines that you would have found on vehicles before, uh, the late 80s, I'd say. And they both ran just fine on, on crude oil. Different grades of crude. The diesel liked light sweet crude, which is what West West Texas Intermediate is, WTI. That's light sweet crude. Diesel engine ran great on it. And the gas engine ran great on uh, light sour crude. And so if uh, Americans had the option of uh, running their vehicles on crude oil, like I said yesterday, that's one thing that Biden could at least try to, because would this solve the, the issue overnight? No, I mean, you're not going to convert all the, you know, but he can't give up the, the great green drift for one thing. Uh, and two, he's not trying to find any solutions to these people, but I'm saying there's lots of things like that. You could say, hey, why don't we just drill for more oil? You know, not only uh, is the refiner's premium currently an issue, but that's that could be a temporary thing. You know, refining costs, they, part of the issue is we don't, you know, build any refineries in this country. Building more oil refineries could certainly erode the refiner's premium. And drilling for more oil, uh, perhaps uh, uh, allowing uh, rapid drilling on public lands with the caveat that that oil can't be exported. I mean, I think that's a I think that's a fair thing if it's on public lands anyway. Uh, I don't, you know, I think that it, it, it's not an overreach of government to say, hey, if you're gonna go on this publicly owned land, taxpayer owned land and drill for oil, you should sell it back to people in America. That oil should go to the people in America and not be sold, you know, on the on the global market. At least when, you know, oil prices are this high, we in America should take advantage of our natural reserves. And even though it would take years for all that to get up to speed, the just Taking those steps would bring down prices uh, via speculation. That's the good kind of speculation because speculators can speculate and drive prices up. They can also speculate and drive prices down. Speculators are trying to essentially forecast where prices will be in the future. And so if you um, give the speculators every indication that oil prices, gas prices, diesel prices, car prices 
housing prices, food prices, all of these commodities will come down in the future through your policies. You can drive them down today and you can show progress to your voters before, before the November election. You can show them, hey, look, we're bringing down food costs. This is how we're doing it. Uh, the closest thing that I saw Biden do to anything on meat was uh, he said he was going to take on big meat, something I covered a couple months ago. I don't remember being particularly impressed with his proposal. Uh, it did not seem very interesting at the time. I should look, go back and look into that again, see if anything's come of it. Because the meatpacking industry is one big bottleneck uh, that you know was government created along the lines of what I was talking about yesterday with the collusion between uh, the big corporate players and the state. And by the state, I mean government collectively. I don't mean a particular state government. I mean the state. You know, the Fed could jack up interest rates, double them overnight, try and pull a Volcker move, and that would send interest rates to the moon, which would uh, bring, would, you know, the, the more you raise interest rates, the faster you're going to bring down housing prices and make it cheaper for people to own a home. It has been low interest rates, as well as a lot of speculation, um, that has driven up the housing market. We have, objectively speaking, a housing bubble, which is hurting ordinary Americans. And Biden could take steps and actually and come out and say, say it publicly, we're going to pop the housing bubble. If Biden came out himself and said, we're going to pop the housing bubble, guess what people are going to start doing? All these investors who own homes, they're going to rush to try and sell their houses. Then all of a sudden, that inventory shortage that we hear so much about with housing, it would be gone overnight because everyone would be rushing to the exits. All the investors who don't want to hang on to these homes who are just trying to make money off of them, they're going to sell. And so there's a lot of things that Biden could be doing and the administration, you know, collectively. If they wanted to make their voters, potential voters, past voters, future voters, feel like they're actually trying to do something to help people uh, with you know, what concerns them. Instead, we're going to get gun control. <laughs> gun control, which is not going to go anywhere. I mean, the best he can do is, of course, the executive orders. There's a lot he can do by executive order. Hell, Donald Trump did a lot by executive order to take away, to infringe upon the Second Amendment. Um, Biden already has taken away Russian ammo, which was the only uh, affordable supply of ammunition. With it, Russian ammo gone, um, there's, there's, uh, you're not going to be uh, putting a lot of rounds downrange unless you're a big rich guy. Of course, he was following the footsteps of George W. Bush before him, who banned Chinese ammo, which was even cheaper than Russian ammo. Um, ironically. Even though Canadians cannot buy handguns now, they can at least still buy Chinese ammo. And after what Trudeau just did in Canada, if I were Biden, I would not be going anywhere near the gun issue. Because not only has Biden talked about, you know, it's, it's crazy. we got to get rid of this 9mm stuff, which is the most common handgun caliber uh, you know, in the country. And handguns, for those of you who don't know, if you're buying a gun for self-defense to carry on your person or like if you're a woman, you want to keep a gun in your, in your chest. You know, most of the time, you're not buying a... AR-15, there are people who do that, keep them by their bedside because the AR-15 is like the new shotgun. People don't really buy shotguns as much anymore. But for someone who wants a, you know, a basic gun to keep around the house that is, you know, compact, that they don't need a giant safe to store in, that they can, you know, keep in their drawer, they buy a handgun. And the most common handgun caliber by far these days is 9mm, it used to be 38 Special, which is pretty similar to 9mm in a lot of ways. Certainly a bullet diameter. Ballistically, you know, 9mm is higher pressure, but, um, you know, it's a smaller case. So I'm not exactly sure if, if you looked at the comparable bullet weights, how different they are ballistically. But they, they fit into a similar class of gun, a similar frame size, even though, you know, one is for a revolver, one's for a semi-auto. Uh, but I'm getting off in the weeds here. Biden talking about banning 9mm is, sounds ridiculous. It sounds like, oh, he couldn't possibly mean that. But then you have Justin Trudeau up in Canada who just banned handguns. Just by executive order. He said, no more handguns. 
you can't buy a handgun anymore. You have no self-defense in Canada anymore. Now, the laws were already written pretty much to uh, make it impossible to defend yourself with a gun in Canada. They would pretty much charge you with murder, even if somebody broke into your house uh, and attacked you if you shot them. Uh, that would not – they wouldn't – they would hold you to a very high standard. They would treat you guilty until proven innocent of murder. But what Trudeau just did put the final nail in the coffin. Good luck trying to defend yourself, you know, from a from a robber with your Ruger M77. And now it'll be very easy. Biden wants to do anything on guns at all, even if he comes out, and I'm sure he's not going to come out with some proposal like Trudeau's and say, we're going to ban handguns or we're going to ban 9mm ammunition, uh, the most common ammo in the country. Uh, other than, you know, 223, but that's a rifle round. Republicans now are going to take Biden's buddy Trudeau and say, hey, this is what Biden's going to do. Trudeau in Canada. Canada, you know that country that's just like us? Uh, Canada, the 51st state, that's run by uh, a center-left guy who's basically a Democrat in Canada? Yeah, he just outlawed handguns by executive order. And if you don't vote Republican, uh, Joe Biden's going to do the exact same thing, too. And nobody in Congress is going to stand up to him. So, you know, we got to do that. We got to impeach Biden and, and all this. And I mean, that's not even Democrats want to get rid of handguns. I mean, Democrat voters. Because even if they don't have, you know, ARs or, or whatever, they still understand that some they still uh, there's still Democrats out there who might not be pro gun and might think, oh, okay, well, any, the, the kind of people I was telling you about who would ban uh, a motorcycle because they drive a Prius, the, even those kinds of people who would be happy to ban an AR-15 because they think, oh, well, what's the use for that? It's much, there's a lot less of them who could make that same point uh, about a 9-millimeter about a handgun because that is, you know, kind of, the, it's the picture of self-defense. And so only the most extreme gun grabbers in the country could even think about something like that. And even if Biden doesn't come out and directly say that tonight, which he most likely won't, Republicans would be idiots not to pin that on him and not to point to Trudeau and say this is exactly what you're going to get from Joe Biden. And so if you want the ability to buy a handgun, you know, they need to just play an ad with a woman in an alleyway who's who gets attacked and you know pulls a handgun out of her purse, a 9mm handgun, and say Joe Biden wants to put a stop to this just like Trudeau did. I mean, it's so stupid. I mean, when you are a president and there's all these problems, you don't look at that. As you don't want to just distract from those problems. You want to take those problems on head on. Uh, you know, if you're not a bought and paid for tool who can't take on problems. If you're a genuine person who's only looking at it from, you know, what can I do to try and make myself look good politically? Those, uh, those problems are opportunities for you to flex your muscles and say, look, I'm going to come here and, and save the day and fix all your problems. Those are the kinds of things that politicians love to do. They want to look like they're problem solvers and they're superheroes. And instead of doing all that, the Biden administration is out here trying to grab guns uh, from American citizens and ship them over to Ukraine. So uh, I don't want to go over 30 minutes. So with that said, I will see you folks back here tomorrow.